All right, welcome everybody to the paper prototyping workshop put on by the Indie Game Academy and the East Bay Game Dev Meetup Group. Uh, so we have a two hour workshop for you guys today. A big chunk of what you're going to be doing today is just building a paper prototype. So hopefully you have some craft supplies with you. If you don't go searching through the house, pillage the kitchen, uh, get some, there you go. Jed has it all set up. Thank you, Jed. Jed will be our demonstrator, our model for the evening. Um, the uh, point of today is to give you some idea of how the how the professional game dev sphere uses paper prototyping. So we're going to give you a demonstration, an introduction on how to actually create them. But we're also going to talk about what situations they're valuable in and then other situations where they're less valuable. Um, Jed here has prepared a demonstration for you. So you're also going to get to see a working prototype. And then all of you will make your own fresh prototype today and play it with somebody in this room. So we're hoping to have a fun time and talk about paper prototyping. Typing. So this is paper prototyping and you. This is just a paper prototyping workshop, but I decided to call it that for some reason. <laughs> this is put on by the East Bay Game Devs and Creatives, Jed here, the representative, as well as the Indie Game Academy. IGA is a program, uh, we call it an indie game accelerator. We run a couple of different programs that help people publish games. That's our main prerogative, our main directive. We run a bunch of really cool programs. And one of the way that one of the ways that we find people to take these programs is we run free classes like this. So as you go through today, if you enjoy this, we would love to have you sign up for some of the stuff that we put on, or at least come and join our Discord. I'll give you some information on that at the end. So for today's agenda, we've got six main things we're going through today. First of all, we're going to talk about why we even prototype in the first place. Um, I it, it is astounding to me, especially for younger creatives, younger creatives in their career, I'm saying, people who haven't been making games for very long. I'm astounded by how many of those people don't prototype because it is such a simple process to go through and it improves the quality of your games by so much. So first, we're going to talk about why you even prototype. Second, we're going to talk about how to paper prototype, what it actually looks like, how to put one together. Third, we're going to see that example game from Jed there. Fourth, you are going to get 20 to 30 minutes to make your own little mini paper prototype. Five, we're going to play those games with each other. And then six will come together, close, have some final thoughts, that kind of stuff. All right, so selecting a game, age old conundrum. How many people have more than, let's say, 10 games that they want to create? I've got only one person. OK, this is actually less than I thought. I'm sure you're all lying. You've come up with many concepts you've wanted to make before. Uh, but it is an age-old conundrum to actually choose what game we work on. I know that at least I personally have so many games that excite me. So how do I actually go about picking one of those games? This is the main reason for us to prototype, or one of the main reasons. An amateur game developer comes up with a concept that they think is cool or unique or whatever, and they go, that's what I'm building. And then they spend four years building it, and then they're disappointed and sad that no one wants to play it, and uh, they feel like they've wasted four years of their life. A game dev god or goddess actually spends the time to go through some kind of written vetting process uh, where they actually take many concepts and reduce it down to the one that they think is the most viable. This increases your chances of success, whatever success actually means to you. Um, and it just is a, uh, it's worth if you're going to spend four years working on a game or even a year working on a game or six months working on a game, it's worth spending just a little bit of time to make sure you pick the right game. So in the next couple of slides, I'm actually pulling this from a lecture by a guy named John Nelson Rose. Some of you may have met, met him, I'm not sure. Um, he's the founder of a company called Opium Play. He now works at EA, uh, and he's a, a huge lover of rapid iteration and prototyping. So the next slides, all the ones that are pink are from him, if you want to look him up and look at some of the stuff that he does. Um, I'm curious, just from the room, I love getting some interaction and engagement going on. Why would you prototype? Why do we prototype? What are some of the reasons to prototype? To uh, reduce risk. Yes. Hey, look at that. Wow. 10 points for you, John. Uh, yes, to reduce risk. That's one of the big ones. And that is a mindset shift that I encourage all of you to, to take in. When we work on a game, for perspective, if anyone hasn't gone through a uh, professional publishing cycle, I worked at Lumosity for a time. They're the brain training game people. The games that we built were really simple, two-dimensional, just memorize like stuff on the screen, that kind of stuff. The production cycle for those games, generally around nine months. So we're spending nearly a year to make a little tiny 2D game. So you can imagine that if you wanted to make a Stardew Valley by yourself or something like that, want to do the classic solo developer journey, you're spending years on it. 
So it's pretty high risk for you to just jump in and be like, yeah, I'm going to give four years of my life to this concept I came up with 30 seconds ago. So the main reason for us to prototype is to reduce that risk. The process that uh, John likes to talk about in his rapid prototyping steps is to define what your actual problems are, research some information, look at some other examples of games, ideate those ideas, and then identify winners. That fifth step, identifying the winners of those potential ideas, is one of the main reasons that we do paper prototyping. Does anybody have, who, who here keeps track of their game concepts? Who's got like a big list of these? If you don't do this, <laughs> here's your first lesson. Um, I don't know how many ideas I come up with on a daily basis. I just have one doc that I throw the idea in. I write like a sentence about it so that I don't forget about it. Um, super useful to be able to go back to old ideas. Even if you never build these games, oftentimes you'll find ideas springing out of other existing ideas. But regardless, there's this classic problem of going, okay, so I've come up with 10, 15, 20, 50 game ideas that I wanna work on. How do I actually reduce that down? Um, this is where we uh, get to what we call concept funneling, which basically just means I dump some ideas in the top of an established funnel, this vetting process that we brought up earlier. And somehow we reduce those ideas down to just the one we're going to actually work on. Uh, so some of the steps that we might use, filter listing is a great one. This is actually a filter list from my own studio called the Delve Bros. Uh, you just basically rank your games in a couple of categories, see how they score. Uh, but paper prototyping is another one of those useful ways to vet ideas and pick a final concept. So enter paper prototyping. Before I show anything off, can somebody describe to me what a paper prototype actually is? I know what it is in like for a non-game app. I do not know what it is mm -hmm. for a game app. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Um, so well, how about this? Describe it to me for a non-game. Um, for a non-game app, uh, often you're working like on a page flow or some, mm -hmm. you know, or there may be reveals and stuff. So yeah. you lay out pictures of what the screen's gonna look like. And then uh, and then you say, well, what would you do to do this? And then you have them. Mm -hmm do that. And then you may even mm -hmm. use post-it notes for things to like drop down a menu or something to just basically create a, you know, a very fast, low fidelity thing that you can use mm -hmm. to make sure your basic ideas are not crazy. Yes. John is racking up the points tonight. Somebody has got to start competing with him. Uh, there's no actual points. I'm making those up. Uh, yeah, you, you pretty much nailed it. And that's pretty much exactly what it is in the gaming world too. It's a, it's a, as close of a representation as we can get to the final product. In this case, it's a game instead of an app using just paper and other physical objects. Um, so the quick example that I have for you, this was created at, um, I'm not exactly sure where this is from. Let me mute this. Um, but this is a group of students who made a multiplayer platformer game where you can actually jump around and play the game. And this is a very classic, simple paper prototype. Um, so a couple of things to point out, each of these players is actually, quote, playing the game. Um, and the game creator, whoever they may be, I think it's this person with the bracelet over here, um, is running the game. They're acting as the game engine. So they're moving stuff around and manipulating things as players activate levers and pick up items. You can see them doing that right here. So uh, what you are essentially getting is a playthrough, a play test of your game with little to no investment. Um, wouldn't be no investment, with very little investment. You don't need to code, you don't need to do art. It's just enough for you to test that core game loop and if the game is actually fun. So it's essentially the same thing as an app wire frame or something like that, except you are doing it for a video game and then you are acting as the game engine. All right, so it's a test meant to reveal something about the game. Typically you are proving or disproving a specific hypothesis. For you guys and the way that I generally use paper prototypes, usually that hypothesis is just, is this game fun? Could this be a good concept? Um, there's no coding. The tester acts as the game engine and it's meant to allow rapid iteration. Uh, so for an example, I worked at a company, uh, when I was working at Lumosity, the first place I worked was called Lumi Kids, which was educational games for two to six-year-olds. Um, and when we were building those games, we churned out, um, we did a pretty intense, I think it was six, I think it was six games in six months, if I'm remembering that right. We did a pretty intense amount of actual prototyping in order to choose those concepts. Um, when we did a digital prototype, so something actually, you know, in Unity or our game engine where the player could actually play on the computer, typically we finish two of those in a week. That's pretty fast as far as digital prototypes go. And even that is a pretty significant investment. If, we're, if we only have six months for our time budget, 
you know, we're putting in a lot of time to test these, um, uh, these paper, uh, these digital prototypes. So a step before that can be our paper prototyping. If we've got 10 ideas of a game that we could deliver to a kid, we can test them super quickly with a paper prototype, just invest an hour per game, and then choose from those which we want to actually commit the time to building digital prototypes for. So what makes a good one founded from a hypothesis? That might just be, is this game fun? That might also be, uh, I'll show you Tailmore a little bit later, which is a game that I worked on semi-recently, which the one of the core hypotheses was we could have a Slay the Spire type combat system that was more fun uh, given that players were working together instead of one player coming up with a combination of cards. So that was our hypothesis for that game, and we wound up proving it with a paper prototype. It has some kind of testable elements. Um, it answers some specific questions for you, and it focuses on player feedback. You're seeking to answer those fundamental questions. Is this fun? Do people understand it? Is it something that could be a promising game? The pros of doing this at all. Uh, so putting together a paper prototype, is it worth it? The pros of this. The, the main one is just that it's super fast. Um, we're going to give you half an hour to come up with a paper prototype, and it may not be the final version of your prototype. You may sort of polish it a little bit before actually moving on, but you can, you can quite uh, realistically put together a paper prototype in half an hour. Um, you can spend an hour or two on it and really make a sleek one, um, but that is still so much less than what it takes to make even the simplest of digital prototypes. Uh, so it's simply about being fast. It's its biggest advantage. It's also cheap to put together. So if we're talking about risk, if we're in our business mindset, it's the lowest level investment for your prototype. So I'm investing less of myself instead of just jumping into four years of development and risking four years of development. I am risking just a couple of hours to do a paper prototype and then some play tests. It requires you to simplify your core game loop, which I always think is really interesting. Um, it's sometimes hard to translate a game concept into a paper prototype, but that exercise can help you focus what your game loop actually is. Uh, and your prototypes, this is an interesting one, you tend to get really honest feedback from these. Um, and I think that's because they are simplified. So people are a little bit more comfortable telling you they don't like the game <laughs> if it's just a piece of paper than if you're actually sending them something that's a little more polished. And they're just fun. The cons, the reasons not to do a paper prototype, they are not very representative of your final game. A lot of the time you're going to be missing features or you're going to have a lot of wait time while people are like, uh, you know, moving elements around for you, stuff like that. Um, some concepts are challenging to translate, but I, 95% of games can become a digital, or excuse me, can become a paper prototype. Anything that is turn-based or requires the player to sit and think, super easy to paper prototype. Do it. No problem. Anything that's live action can be hard. Uh, so, you know, imagine trying to make a FPS game. Um, that's going to be hard. <laughs> but for most games, you can get some kind of a test just on paper. Um, so an example I like to use, I had a student at one point who put together, uh, was making a game where you acted as a cat who had gotten loose on a space station. And this cat can wander around and mess with stuff on the space station, a 3D live action game. In order to paper prototype it, he just had a, like a Word document with a picture of a cat that he would drag around the screen. And then like some pictures of stuff the cat was allowed to interact with. And the player would just say like, I want to move over to the box. And then uh, one of the ways that he tested if this was a good concept is he had a button that was hidden on the screen that the player could find. And if he pushed the button, if you had the player touch the button, he would drag this JPEG of an exploded space station onto the screen and be like, you found the self-destruct button, congratulations. Uh, and, and every single time he did that, he got a laugh out of the player, even though this is just some JPEGs he slapped onto a screen in like 30 seconds. Uh, so that is a perfect example. Like that game, you can't really test on paper, but you can get a sense of if people think this is going to be fun. Um, it cannot be played without the game creator. That's another big negative. If I have a digital prototype, I can send it to like 400 people and give them a survey and get feedback from them. Can't do that with a paper prototype, of course. And assuming the concept performs well, you're probably going to make a digital prototype anyway. So you may be wasting the time. Um, so the, the place where these really shine is what do I even spend the time to digital prototype? They really shine in that step before committing to building anything. A, uh, this is sort of just game design 101 and not necessarily paper prototyping, but something I find important to call out. When you're building a game, all of the elements of a game, the music, the art, the game design, the story, the code, they don't sit on the same line. Uh, the game design is the backbone of your game, nine times out of 10. There are games that uh, the game design is extremely simple. So like narrative-based games, for instance, where you're just choosing story options, 
where there are other elements that hold more of the weight, where the story in that game would matter a lot more. But in the majority of games, your game design matters most. We've all played games that AAA studios dumped millions of dollars into that look gorgeous, but are trash games that are just not fun. <laughs> and we've all played the opposite too. Little indies with incredible uh, uh, game design, Stardew Valley, like I just mentioned, um, where the art or whatever is not as strong, but the game design itself is immaculate. So that's really what you're trying to test here. You're getting at the game design. Could this be fun? Uh, and remember that you are the game engine. So this is an example that when I found I love, this is just like off of Reddit. This is a paper prototype right there, adorable. Uh, a couple of things to call out here, besides just being adorable. Um, first of all, you can see that the game creator, the game creative is acting as the game engine, right? So they are actually dropping the new pieces in, deciding which pieces to drop, deciding at which speed to drop the pieces. And then they're engaging with their player and their player can actually play. The other part of this though, that I think is really important is this is not a representative version of Tetris. There is one key element to the game design of Tetris that's missing here. Can anybody point out what that is? There's no real time pressure, or at least yeah. not, not the falling block aspect. Yeah, no real time pressure and uh, lines don't disappear when you complete a line. Oh yeah, that's right? it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which would be much more challenging to make a paper prototype for because you'd have to like, you know, I don't know, remove the pieces or like cut them or something. That could be kind of fun. Um, but what he is getting is some kind of a test of if this is a compelling game. And he seems to have answered that with a yes. This little girl is enjoying herself playing this game, even though it's missing core features. So you're not looking for a representative game. You're looking to test that core game loop, right? Is it fun? All right. So one thing that people get uh, concerned about sometimes is where to actually begin. As I've said a few times now, the place to start is simply the core game loop. So identify what the player is going to be doing over and over again. Uh, so in Tailmore, the dungeon crawler that we created, there's a combat system that's similar to Slay the Spire. So the turn begins, enemies display what they're actually going to do. They're going to attack a character or whatever. Then the players choose their attacks, what they're going to do in response. The attacks resolve and we go back to a new turn. So this is our core game loop. Uh, in order to start building a paper prototype, identify that and then put together some pieces that you can actually use to run this test. So. I'm not going to go too in depth into this because Jed has a great example game for us in just a moment. But to show you, this is a, a real digital paper prototype that I put together to test the combat for our deck building, um, dungeon crawling board game. And you can see that it's just you know some JPEGs on the screen in order to demonstrate what the enemies are planning to do. It's just a piece of text. So it just says that it's, this character is going to stab at the rogue. You can see that my UI is replaced with just a whole heck load of text. It tells us what stab does way over here, but it's enough for the player to be able to play. It's enough for us to test if this combat is compelling. Our key hypothesis here was that uh, we could limit what each individual player could do, but still have an interesting level of combos and um, intersections of moves by having multiple players doing things at the same time. So in our game, instead of you uh, doing two moves back to back that create an interesting combination of moves. We have uh, multiple players all doing one thing. Uh, you can see the, the rogue here is going to heal himself and the wizard as always, as wizards do, is going to fireball the rune. All right. So I believe that is, it's just about time for Jed to jump in. The biggest questions that you're looking to answer with a paper prototype are three things. Number one is just, could this be fun? This is the game design question. Could this be a compelling game? Could it be interesting? So you're looking to see the player's reaction. You're looking to see if even through this ugly piece of paper that you put together, am I delivering some magic? Uh, and you're looking for those magic moments. So that paper prototype that my student made of the kitten that could explode a space station, that's a magic moment. He got people to laugh pretty much every time he did that. Now, not only does he know that the game could be fun, but he also knows what is the magic of this game and what he can maximize on when he moves forward in production. So add more stuff with similar along the similar veins. Um, you know, maybe the kitten can explode the space station, but they can also mess with the life support or you know break the shield so an asteroid runs in a part of the station or something like that. What are those magic moments that you get that you can expand upon to make your game better? And then the third thing, and this is one that I find people skip a lot, is what are the risks or the weaknesses of this game? Um, some of them are going to be inherent in paper prototyping. Generally, it's going to be really slow. If I was running this this prototype, I'd have to you know manually update each of these pieces of text and come down here and tell them what you're going to do. Um, 
it takes some time. So there's some inherent weaknesses that are just a part of the medium, but you're also looking for what could sync the actual idea. Um, so, you know, people don't care about uh, putting moves together with their party members and they're kind of disappointed if they only get one move. That's an inherent risk. If I ran into that, maybe I wouldn't work on this idea further. Okay. I am going to hand it over to Jed for a second. Jed, are you, are you prepared? I am. Yay. Heck yeah. <laughs> All right. So Jed is going yeah. to show off an example. Uh, yeah, take it away. Five, five or 10 minutes. So for the sake of demonstration, um, my prototype is probably even simpler than what most of you are going to create tonight. Uh, it's really just an exercise in testing a rule set. So I came up with a set of rules and I started testing it. So I was looking around for materials, looking for inspiration. Uh, I kind of just plopped everything on a desk and was like, okay, here's some paper, here's some scissors. And uh, the thing that I was attracted to was my Dungeons and Dragons dice, just because I like Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm playing a campaign right now. And I'm like, what if you took Dungeons and Dragons dice, you know, a set of random, random number generators, essentially, and played Yahtzee with them? <laughs> so that's where the kind of seed of the idea started. Um, and as we, as we know, uh, Yahtzee is where you roll five six-sided dice, uh, standard, you know, casino dice. Uh, you get uh, three rounds of rolling and you can, at the end of any one of those rounds, you can set aside uh, some of the dice and that becomes essentially kind of like a poker hand that you're building over the three rounds. And you get a certain amount of points, a certain amount of points based on like what combination of, uh, you know, straights and um, what am I trying to say, pairs and triplets and all that that you get at the end of your round. I tried that um, with the different dice that I have from Dungeons and Dragons, which for the sake of uh, explanation is a four-sided dice, six-sided dice, eight, 10, 12, and 20. And it was a bit complex. So <laughs> uh, to try and come up with these different, you know, hands that someone would have within all that combination. So I was like, okay, um, maybe there's another way to go about this. So uh, what I did is that I kind of pivoted and I was like, okay, what if I had a set of numbers at the beginning of the round that were randomly generated that the person then had to go and try to match. So that is essentially the game that I came up with. The interesting element that emerged from this is that the range you generate from your numbers is really important. Like if I, if I were to generate, you know, a, a list of random numbers from one to 10, it's very, it's much more difficult than a list of random numbers from one to four. Basically, I kept thinking about this and I was like, okay, well, this could either be a mini game in D&D. &D. Like uh, in D&D, &D, you have to roll just a D20 and uh, the, the rogue might lockpick the door or not. Or it could be, you know, in something like Skyrim where uh, you're trying to match up certain colors to different pins on a lock or something like that. So I'll show you the paper prototype that I came up with. I'm actually going to play a couple of rounds as well. Here is a lock that I made earlier. This one's an easy lock. Uh, and <laughs> we can think of this, okay, let's, let's give myself um, five rounds to try and beat this lock. So I've got, uh, I'm gonna remove this dice because it doesn't belong, but these other six ones, I can roll them all. Let's get a little bit of shot here. I'm trying to get a three and a two. So I got a three and a two, I got on the first one. And ta-da, I win. So that was Yay. an easy lock. <laughs> that was an easy lock. So let's try a very hard lock. <laughs> This one is uh, six pins or tumblers, depending on how much you know about locks. And let's say I'm a pretty good rogue, so I have uh, five different chances to get this. So yeah, we're looking for threes and twos and fives and sixes and ones. Now, probably gonna get a few of those. So I've got a five, got a one, got a three. And now the strategic, the strategic decision needs to come in. Is that like, Yes, I rolled a three here, but also these ones tend to roll higher. So I should probably maybe save the, the four-sided dice for now, but place these other two. So there's some strategy that comes into it. Uh, so now I've, I've done one round. So now we're on round two. Looking for, oh, I got a six on the D20. That's wonderful. Uh, and none of these other ones are useful. So I'll place a six. Onto my lock here, got that pin. I got two more, I'm looking for a three and a two. Uh, there's a two, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I think I'll 
place that one. We've got two rounds of rolling left. Looking for a three. Look for three. Our last round. If I don't get this three, I don't get it. So here. Maybe luck. Come on. Ah, I failed the luck. So you can get the idea that like this could be a really exciting thing for a group of adventurers to do. That is my paper prototype. And you know, I think that like in a game, you could put a skin over this to make it like more like an actual lock, of course. But really what I'm doing is testing a, a rule set. So in that, in that my hypothesis was proven in that like, this is an easy lock, this is a very hard lock. And that proved to be the case. So there you go, that's my uh, paper prototype. Nice, congratulations, that's <laughs> awesome. I hadn't actually seen that yet, guys. That was my first experience. <laughs> For the rest of you. Um, I love I, I like a couple of things that you did there, Jed. Um, the first one, I love the use case that you mentioned. This could be something, you know, I like to DM. This could be something that I give to my players. Perfect example of a real world reason to paper prototype besides actual game production. Um, I also like how you sort of went through a couple of iterations even in the paper prototype. That's another example of how you're saving time by doing it on paper because I don't need to adjust my core programming. I can hammer it out just by scribbling stuff on a piece of paper until I'm like kind of ready, you know, fairly prepared until I uh, before I start actually putting it into the digital form. So well done, that was wonderful. You also saw how to run a play test even over camera. So one of us could have been playing that game and Jed would have just rolled the dice for us. Not as nice as doing it in person, but totally viable, totally reasonable. So it's about time for you guys to make some games. Um, we are gonna do about half an hour. Um, we're looking good on time, so we should be fine. Uh, we are gonna give you a couple of different things. We're gonna do a couple of different things. I'm gonna, one, we have how many people? We've got 10 people in the room. So maybe we'll do three rooms. Um, each of those rooms is, you'll just be sitting there with a couple of people. The whole reason is just that you have a, a few people to talk to instead of a big daunting room while you have 20 to 30 minutes to put together your own paper prototype. We are going to give you a theme like this is a mini game jam in just a second. You will follow that theme in order to make a fresh original paper prototype and practice this practice. Uh, at the end of that 30 minutes, or if everybody finishes early, we can finish early. We're going to come back together, maybe talk about it a little bit, uh, and then do some play tests. We'll do a speed round of what I like to call speed dating play testing, where you're going to be put into a room with just one other person. You will play your game and then play their game with them. So you have a couple of minutes to do both. Uh, and the two of us during all of that time, Jed and Willem, will be popping around, giving you some advice, answering questions, etc. cetera. Um, okay, here we go. Your theme. We're going to split you into breakout rooms in just a second. Uh, your theme to make a paper prototype over the next 30 or so minutes will be three minutes or less. So these have to be games that you can play in paper prototype fashion, which is typically slow, with another person in under three minutes. OK, so you have about 30 minutes. Jed and I will be coming around. We'll switch back and forth between the two rooms a little bit. If you have questions, you can ask the room. Uh, and you've got 30 minutes to put something together on paper. We will then be testing it together. So you'll be you know, pointing your camera at the paper. So maybe an extra constraint for you is something that's not too difficult to play over a camera. All right, the rooms are open. You should now get a prompt. No, they aren't. There we go. You should now get a prompt to join. Uh, so because we're doing totally fine on time, um, I thought we would do a little example just to get everybody in the mood and understand how playtesting works. Um, so I guess here, let me give the mini lecture. I've just got three slides on playtesting and then I'm gonna hand it over to Adrian to run his game because I thought it was really fun. So playtesting is, is really truly, uh, I make a joke with my students sometimes about how prototyping and playtesting, basically playing your game with people is, is like the one secret. You know, everybody's like, uh, here's the, the 10 secrets to game development. This is the one secret. Uh, this is above all else, the thing you can do to make your games better. Play your games with real people, play them with a diverse set of people and play games with people consistently throughout your entire production process. You'll make such a better game. So I'm gonna talk uh, just for a couple of slides about how to run a solid play test. A lot of people have different perspectives on this, but this is how I approach it. Um, the primary reason that we play test is because it breaks us out of our biases. So we might think that our game is amazing and easy to understand, but that's because we built the game. And until we play it with real people, we won't know that it isn't amazing and is way too confusing. 
the people that you play test with are the people you wind up building the game for. So if you only play your game with your mom, you are building an exceptional game for your mom and nobody else. So actually run your play tests with a diverse set of people. What I recommend you do is choose your target audience who you're actually building this game for, um, you know, casual RPG fans or something like that, and then play test with them. And then do a couple of play tests outside of that sphere as well to test your hypothesis of who actually loves your game. And then also just to get some outside perspectives as well. Um, and you can play test more than just the game design like we're doing here. So you could do a test on the UI or on a new boss or something like that. What makes a good play test founded from a single hypothesis? This game could be fun. This boss could be fun. Finish by proving or disproving that hypothesis. Focus on the player feedback. So you're there to hear their responses. You're not there to show somebody a cool game and leave with some action items. Man, they really hated this boss. We got to get rid of it. Before you actually start play testing, create a prototype. You all have done that. Congratulations. Uh, come up with that hypothesis or objective. Today, you're just trying to see if this is a fun game. Decide on any questions that you need answered. Is this boss understandable? Is there, you know, is there tell good enough? Do the, does the player know they're going to do an overhead swing? I don't know. What are some of the things you actually need answered? Um, and then find somebody to play, of course. During the play test, introduce your game. But here's one that I find a lot of people not doing. Give them just enough information. A lot of people will like flood you with the entire life story of them and their game and how they spent so long coming up with this concept and how, man, I really just like love this concept and I hope you love it too. Don't do that. Primes them for a terrible experience, wastes time, give them just enough to play. This is Tailmore. It's the scan and play dungeon crawling board game. You're going to be testing the combat in Tailmore. You're going to pick one card to use every turn to fight these monsters and then have them start playing. Give them just enough to play. You can answer more questions if you need to, if they get confused. And then another really big one, ask them to think out loud. So as they play, just literally at the beginning say, and if you would, please think out loud as much as you can. Because a lot of the times when people are playing games, they don't make any noise. And then you are not you know, privy to the information that they are processing as they play. Avoid distracting them. Don't talk to them unless they need to ask you a question or something and take lots of notes. Post play test. Uh, go for, here's another funnel. We love funnels here. Go for sort of like a funnel approach to asking questions, asking for feedback. So start with the biggest, most open-ended questions. What did you think? And then get a little bit more specific. Uh, what did you think about the combat? What did you think about this particular enemy? Was this specific move understandable or too confusing? Did you like this UI? By starting the most open-ended, you'll get the most sort of authentic feedback. Um, because one of the things that is tough about play tests is people tend to try to tell you what they think you want to hear. So by asking just open-ended questions, you are leading them on the least. And then write down your action items. And that's basically it. So we're going to do a play testing exercise now. I'm going to have Adrian run a little sample play test. Um, so Jed, did you play Adrian's game with him? No. All right. He was, he was quite upset about with me for that. <laughs> do you want to volunteer to play with him now then adrian you want to run a little play test yes all right so here's your demo guys um okay this game we got two sides each have eight scrabble tiles we're each going to try and make a word from any subset of these scrabble tiles and those two words are going to compete compete against each other and the criterion is based on a random adjective that's generated by a website up here. In this case, it's going to be shivering. So Jed, shivering. come up with the most shivering word you can. Okay. And I will do the same. So Adrian there did a great job of giving just enough information for Jed to play, but not leading him on too much or anything like that. A few minutes later. Okay, I'm going to go with my very first word. Me too. <laughs> um, why don't you say first, since I've already isolated my word, and I can prove it. OK, mine is bite, B-I-T-E. B -I -T -E. Hey, that's what I was thinking of, too. OK, I went with fail, because people are afraid Ooh. to fail. And when people are fearful, they shiver sometimes. Okay. Nice. Mine is Jed, what bite. is your? No, oh, yeah, part, part of the game bite. is to like, we're, we're like lawyers. We're trying to like, like yeah. <laughs> prove that ours is the one that we like or that is, uh, we mine deserve is bite to win. because of uh frostbite oh that's pretty good yeah that's pretty good i mean other i think, other I, think I do <laughs> i i vote for jed but i also i, I do too <laughs> i think i vote for uh tony or anthony more because he says so, wet 
Oh, yeah, that's oh, good. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Nicely done. And it's that's right. pretty good, too. I like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is where uh, Adrian would probably start asking Jed what he thinks and uh, trying to vet if this is a promising idea. But for the sake of tonight, we can just move on. Thank you for showing off your game, Adrian. So the idea is basically, um, so I took your name, Tic Tac Tesseract. So it's it's a 3D tic-tac-toe board cube. And so when you claim, you know, it, like regular tic-tac-toe, you claim a, a, a square or a, a space. So now you're going to claim a cube. So if you claim a corner piece, you'll be claiming all three. If you okay. claim center piece, you're only getting the one. And then if you claim a side piece, you'll be getting the, the two faces. And so, I mean, my, my initial idea was, okay, well, Maybe I can do three tic-tac-toe boards, mm -hmm. but it, it, I, I quickly thought, oh, I, can't make, I can't make that work. So then I went, made the cube and then I'm like, well, maybe it's easier to make the, you know, the, the flattened cube. Right. Uh, I did recognize that, you know, if I claim this one, I'm going to have to do some mental math and go, okay, well then I'm going to claim this one and this one and right. this one <laughs> down here. Um, I'll be X. So uh, I think X goes first, right? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm going to claim the top right spot on A, face A. Okay. So that will give me the bottom right on E and the top left on B. Yep. Okay. Okay, I'm going to claim... Huh. <laughs> Let's say the top right on B. Top right on B of the circle. Okay, so then that'll be the top right on E. Correct. And top left on C. Yeah? Correct. Yep, that's what it is for me too. Okay, uh, I'm going to claim the bottom left on face A. Yeah. <laughs> what do I feel like I already lost? Okay. I'm going to claim the only one I can and do the middle on A. Okay. And then I'm going to claim the bottom right on A. Uh -huh. Just top right on F and bottom left on B. Okay. And then I'm going to play the bottom on A. <laughs> um, Which we I, get the side. That's I would well. do the right. Yeah, exactly. So you get the top on F as well. And then I guess I would do the right on A, the right, right yeah. middle. And then you win. Yeah. Okay. So the thing that immediately pops out for me is that whoever goes first has a pretty big advantage, just like in the real tic tac toe. Yeah. Yeah. Because like basically what you did is you played like the perfect strategy on one of the faces, right? Um, and I actually I think I blocked you incorrectly, but. Um, so it's like, how do you have it be, how, how can you implement mechanics in a way where the fact that it's 3D gives one of the players an unfair advantage if they look ahead a few moves or something along those lines? Yeah, because that's what I'm thinking. And it's, um, on the one hand, the cube makes it a lot easier to visualize, but I was almost wondering if the 2D, you know, the, if, you, if you lay the cube flat out, it requires a little more effort to figure out where, like if I claim this square, it's also claiming this square and that square. Right. And so, you know what I mean? Like it's relatively simple. I say, oh, well, okay, it's these three or it's these two. But I'm wondering if maybe the laid down flat version might even be a little more interesting because you have to like, because then you then, then it's a slot. I mean, as right. much as code can be, a little bit of battle of wits, right? Because you're like, okay, so I can visualize, and I guess at that point, then it becomes who can visualize the cube better. Yeah, and if you look at like the 4D chess boards, that's sort of what they do. That's how they lay it out. Okay. So yeah, so I'm not exactly sure how we would play through it, but let's just say, yeah, okay. say we, you know, we're going, we see someone here and I see that they're coming this way. Mm -hmm. so then I'm going to get behind the couch while they continue on so i'm going in between the couch and the table and then so i so and the thing is that you don't know where the dog is too it's it's apparent here but mm -hmm. you wouldn't know so you'd have to check every room um so i'm saying okay i want to go to this kitchen area first right 
And then this person turns around, let's just say you get caught. So you have to talk to Uncle Jimmy or maybe just Jimmy. And maybe there's a little prompt that says, like, talks about cruise minus 15 seconds or something like that. I was just saying, like, maybe you could pepper in some, like, clues throughout the the house. So, like, you would know, like, this particular character was, like, interested in this. Although that might be... So avoid that topic. Yeah. (laughs) Or they don't, they really hate this, or they don't like yeah. this person, so. They hate crypto, so go talk about crypto. <laughs> Get them that's, out of there real quick. That's a good idea. Maybe it's like, maybe the dog or whatever the, the objective is, isn't as impaired. So maybe it's like, hopefully you don't have a dog in a cabinet, but like, maybe like the cabinet's rustling or something's rustling and you open mm-hmm. it and it may or may not be the objective, but instead it will say, like you said, Jed, like, yeah, you know, Uncle Jimmy doesn't like crypto. It'll be something like that. So even though you're not getting to the objective, you're getting something that could help you if you do get caught. Yeah, but uh, thank you guys. No, that, that, that's it though. <laughs> that's really cool. I, I really like it. Um, so I hope you noodle on it some more. I want to. Yeah. No, I appreciate your guys' feedback. Welcome back, everybody. Hopefully you had fun play testing. Uh, so we're pretty much wrapping down now, closing it up. Um, I think let's just have like a little bit of open dialogue since we have a couple of extra minutes. What are some of the things that you guys learned today, either about playtesting, maybe about your specific game, something you might change? What are some of your takeaways from today? Yeah, I, I think honestly, um, one really big thing um, that I learned from today is that one, it doesn't take too long to actually make a paper prototype. And then two, it really validates like, you know, is this fun or not? Because I feel like when I first was drawing everything, I'm like, oh, okay, this in my head conceptually, it seems like a good idea, but until I get it down, I don't mm-hmm. know if it's really fun. And then it wasn't until I play tested it with with um, with Tyler and then also Jed as well to kind of just show how it would work. And there were, they had a lot of great ideas about how to actually make it more fun. And then from there, yeah. I can kind of make other ideas. So definitely a good way to make sure, like you said, you don't waste too much time or years yeah. even <laughs> on a game that may not even be fun. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's really, uh, we are almost always depending on the person and their personality, I guess, we're almost always the biggest fan of our own games. So being able to break ourselves out of that little box and just let somebody else tell us the the truth can be really valuable. And paper prototyping is one of the fastest ways to do that. Any other thoughts or lessons or just interesting moments that you had from today? Honestly, I'm honestly just impressed that everybody like 16 minutes ago, we got started on making paper prototype games and you've all already made them and tested them have a general yeah. idea of which direction they could go so like well done everyone like that was impressive yeah it really is so, something that i noticed is a lot of you uh have sort of a concept but not a full game loop and i think you started to notice that so like marcus for instance you were like here's this concept we're like avoiding relatives it's a moment a, a relatable moment that i have and that i think other people have but then when you actually put down on paper what the gameplay is like you found it a little bit lacking it sounds like so that's a, a perfect way for you to go, okay, so I have a concept and people think it's funny, um, but the, the loop needs more work. The loop needs you know a little bit more massaging. All right, uh, so does anybody have any further questions before we shut down and say goodbye to each other? Uh, I, I, just a quick question. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I think that, that I, you know, is kind of a takeaway for me is, you know, being able to do something on paper means that you can iterate quickly on it, right? So like I I actually came up with like three different versions of 3D tic-tac-toe, right? I was yeah. thinking of like, okay, maybe I'll do it three three boards, maybe I'll do an actual cube, maybe I'll do a flat cube. And just yeah. even go to the, the play test and I'm like, uh the cube is nice, but it might be too simple. And mm-hmm. so I, I was thinking, well maybe this flat one might be a little more interesting because when you when you claim a, a face, you're also having to claim other faces. And on the cube, it's relatively easy. I can say, oh, it's just these three, right? But on the flat one, it might be a little more interesting. So I just I, I thought that was a nice uh, nice kind of way to iterate quickly on on these ideas rather than yeah. like, you know having to go through all your bug tests and make sure it works and then yeah. spin, come back. Mm-hmm starting over <laughs> yeah it, it almost gives you a little bit more flexibility because uh, inherent in a video game inherent in any kind of code base when you want to change something there's 15 different things that are all relying on that thing that you also have to change um versus in paper you just crumple it up throw it in the trash and get a new one 
Yeah, the nice thing about paper prototypes is your manager is not tempted to ship it. <laughs> That's good too. Because like, if you, if you show it on a computer screen, they'll tell you, why can't we <laughs> ship this today? Because, you know. Why can't we just send this? <laughs> Love that. All right, so let's shut it down. I have a little bit of homework for everyone here. Uh, which is run this play test with somebody in person. It's such a different experience and another huge part of why paper prototypes are awesome that you can actually sit down with somebody at a table and put this thing on the table and actually play with them, get them to physically touch it, interact with it. Um, here, you know, we're in COVID times. So I like to, a lot of my lessons are taught over video camera and you can definitely get a lot done just over camera, but so valuable to sit down with somebody in the real world. So that's your homework. A bonus for you is to paper prototype a different concept that you've been thinking about. So if there's something else that you really want to make, throw together a paper prototype, maybe share it in your guys' Discord, um, and then potentially come share it in our Discord. So like I said, we run uh, programs to help people publish games. Our main one is a three-month accelerator. It's super fun and awesome. Because I know all of you are cool people and not weirdos, uh, or at least weirdos in the best of ways, you are invited to come join the Discord there. And if you want to talk about joining any of our programs, we would love to have you. I've got a Calendly here. You can schedule a call with me. If you just want to chat about life too, I'm down for that. All right. Uh, anybody have any last questions or anything to say? I've had a great time working with everybody. I love running classes like this. This is actually the first time Jed and I did the paper prototyping class. We sort of yeah. conceived of this together. Um, so would love to hear feedback too, if anyone has feedback on this particular exercise. It's okay. I want to say thank you guys very much. I enjoyed it. And, uh, Definitely. All right. Uh, so yeah, come hang out in the IGA Discord. Definitely keep hanging out in the Game Devs Discord, uh, the East Bay Game Devs Discord. We'll keep doing more stuff together in the future, I am sure. Um, and if you want to chat about doing a crazy, basically online Hogwarts for game development, feel free to hit that Calendly and schedule a call with me. I'd love to chat. And on the East Bay right. Game Devs, and I just want to say real quick that like uh, it's crossed my mind a few times that I'd really like to do one of these in person. That would definitely be, be post GDC because I'm running like a million events right now and I have no brain space left. But uh, eventually in the future, Willem and, I, Willem and I might collaborate on something like that. So we'll see. But I hope you enjoyed tonight. A little bit yeah. of a test run. So thanks for bearing yeah. with us. Thank you, everybody. Take care. I'm going to go to sleep. It's like almost 11 here. <laughs> Good night, Willem. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Good everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.